Hey, gang, this week's episode is brought to you by OldSchoolShirts.com. Hey, check them out. You like defunct teams and leagues and T-shirt form? Well, you'll find them there, but a whole bunch of other stuff, too. Do you remember a radio station of the past or perhaps a mall that you used to go to? All kinds of great cultural and sports memories can be found at the great folks at OldSchoolShirts.com. Promo code GOODSEATS for 10% off all of your purchases. And now, here's our show. It all began on May 11 against Kyle Rudd Jr. and the Dallas Tornado. Old, antiquated Spartan Stadium was alive with excitement and anticipation. 15,678 people were on hand to kick off the season. Most were in their seats early for the opening night pregame festivities that included the Shakers. Besides being an attractive addition on game night, the girls were an integral part of the Earthquake's people-to-people promotional effort. The highlight of the opening night pregame festivities occurred when Milan Mandrick warmly welcomed the historic first night throng, saying he hoped that all visiting teams would be sorry they found their way to San Jose. The sports world was shocked as the walls of Spartan Stadium shook with the ever-increasing crowds that grew to more than 20,000 people. Milan's prophecy came true. Crazy George, the Quake's instigator, delivered the opening game ball in his now nationally renowned and unique style. The first game ever for the Earthquakes, it was just like being at Camelot, I guarantee. It was such a special feeling for the community at large, for the Earthquake players, and for me. You can't put in words the excitement. It gave the town an identity they never had before, and the Quakes gave them that major league image, and it was just super. At first, it, it, it was 16,000 people. They had to delay the game 45 minutes because they weren't ready for the crowd. They were probably expecting six, 8,000, you know. They promoted it, but they had no idea. And all at once, there was 100 people deep in each booth trying to buy tickets, and nobody could get in. So they just they had to delay the game. And so for 45 minutes, they sold tickets and sold tickets, and pretty soon, they finally started the game and had all 15,000 people in. And of course, with a, no team ever drawing over 8,000 a game, and here now we're the new team in the league, and we put 15,000 in the seats, unheard of. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Greetings and salutations, friends. My name is Tim Hanlon. The name of the podcast is Good Seats Still Available, and hopefully you know by now its focus is on what used to be in professional sports, what we do for you each and every week around here. Thanks for coming on by, whether you're a rookie or a veteran. We appreciate it to no end, and uh, we are ecstatic uh, to have our old friend Gary Singh back to the proceedings this week. Uh, It's been a while, December of 2017. Geez, that's a long time. Uh, But uh, the story and the conversation uh, is an embellishment on the one we had then. And we're always uh, excited to learn more about this particular topic. And uh, that, of course, is the San Jose Earthquakes celebrating now their 50th year uh, this season as MLS gears up as we record this already underway. And um, as we'll learn uh, in this uh, discussion this conversation with Gary coming up in a few moments, uh, the relationship uh, and the story of this team are uh, uh, something to behold. Uh, in many respects, a, a microcosm and a representative uh, a story of uh, professional soccer in the United States, at least the modern day version. Uh, the Earthquakes, uh, a uh, legendary name and one of the um, standout franchises in the old North American Soccer League. Uh, They were an expansion franchise in 1974, hence the 50th anniversary. Uh, But like a lot of teams that are around in either an MLS or in the memories of 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 those who followed these uh, these teams back in the day, uh, a lot of um, uh, discontinuity, shall we say, a lot of sideways uh, journeys, uh, dead ends, if you will. Very representative of the professional uh, history, professional uh, league history in this country uh, as uh, leagues collapsed. Uh, or, uh, you know, died off or or morphed into other things or got reincarnated. The NASL has been back in a reincarnated version, not with the earthquakes, but it certainly died an untimely death in 1985. The 
then Go- Golden Bay earthquakes, as they were known, um, were, I think, uh, already uh, uh, on their last legs uh, even before the league collapsed. Um, and uh, and the earthquakes franchise actually didn't even come back in its name until the San Jose Clash decided that they preferred the earthquakes name from the from the Wayback Machine uh, in their first incarnation in Major League Soccer. In between all kinds of uh, shenanigans and 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 things, the San Jose Clash, which was the name of the new San Jose f- franchise in 1996. Uh, that went over well for a good three years. I, I, well, I'm being facetious, right? I mean, uh, perhaps one of the more memorable, if not the most memorable, jerseys in, in Major League Soccer with the scorpion and the lime green and white and the, I, who knows, all kinds of craziness with, uh, with that shirt. Look that up. But uh, a whole host of franchises that uh, filled in, shall we say, between 1985 and 1996 in the in things like the Western Soccer Alliance and the American Professional Soccer League and uh, all kinds of different sort of. But make no mistake, uh, the the through line is very clear, as uh, Gary will, uh, will make the case for in our conversation. Uh, today's San Jose earthquakes, uh, uh, you know, a non straight align to 1974, as it might be, are very much the embodiment of the soul of this uh, soccer history in the Bay Area and specifically in the city of San Jose. And that's the celebration. And the book, as part of that celebration, is a, a must read and a, uh, a quality read at that. It's called The Unforgettable San Jose Earthquakes, Momentous Stories on and Off the Field by this week's guest Gary Singh. And uh, it is um, available now wherever you find Good books. It is published by the History Press. Um, you can get it wherever you find books. And, and if you want to support your local bookseller, just go down the street and ask them to uh, to get a copy of this for you if they don't already have it in stock. Uh, or just go to our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Search up this episode with Gary, uh, numbered 338. You'll find a couple of convenient links uh, to get yourself a copy of this book, Toot Sweet. And uh, before we get into our chat, uh, I would like to let you know that depending on when you're listening to this episode, I think we're dropping it on what, the 26th of February, 19, 19, 2024. We uh, encourage you to uh, meet Gary in person and uh, get yourself a a signed copy of this book. Uh, He will be at the uh, first two home games of the San Jose Earthquakes Major League Soccer season. Coming up, those uh, games are on uh, March the 2nd against the LA Galaxy and Saturday, March the 9th against the Vancouver Whitecaps, uh, themselves a uh, uh, legacy franchise from the old NASL days. Again, Saturday, March 2nd against the Galaxy and Saturday, March the 9th against the Whitecaps at PayPal Park. Uh, Just look for Gary at the uh, General Merchandise Store there, uh, and he will be there to uh, say hello to. Uh, to take pictures with. I'm sure you'd love to take a photo uh, and send that to me and let me know that uh, you guys uh, connected courtesy of this show and get a signed copy of this book, for God's sakes. By all means, please do so. Uh, It's a great book. It's a fun read, lots of photos and uh, lots of good uh, narration around those photos. And it's uh, literally just a a step-by-step journey of all those 50 years, uh, dating back to the the 70s all the way through uh, the current franchise today. And um, let us also hearken back to that um, clip that you heard to set up the uh, the conversation uh, at the top of this uh, this show. Um, this uh, film that I only recently discovered was that it came out in 2020 uh, in the haze of the um, of the pandemic, uh, and it's great. It's about an hour long. You'll find it on YouTube and uh, on the San Jose Earthquakes website. It's called Unshakable: The Pioneers of Earthquakes Soccer, and uh, I, I don't know who the uh, relatively timid narrator voice uh, that you heard in there. It's from the 1974 season recap film uh, that the earthquakes of 74 did. Uh, but the uh, the end voice you heard there is the unmistakable dulcet tones of our old pal, episode number seven, uh, mind you, from April of 2017, Crazy George Henderson, who is still revered in the Bay Area today and very much part of the San Jose Earthquakes of today family. 
uh, dating all the way back to the original San Jose Earthquakes version in 1974. We do talk about that a little bit in our conversation coming up with Gary, but uh, if you want to hear all the uh, the deeper details of that, I highly encourage you to find our episode number seven with uh, with George, um, wherever you uh, get this uh, this feed or on our website, of course, at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, George is a, uh, a force of nature and uh, a unique character and wonderful uh, individual. And um, although we've never met in person, uh, I, uh, I just that was a, a just a tremendous conversation and, and what a story uh, he has there. So highly encourage that, too. All right. So let's get to our chat with Gary. We had it a couple of weeks back. Uh, it was a wonderful one. Uh, let's uh, go back into the earthquakes origin story, shall we? Please, as always, enjoy. I was um, looking back on the uh, the calendar, and I cannot believe it's been six years since we had our first conversation. It all, it seems kind of like yesterday. Yeah, well, the book is actually 2015, so 2000. So that's been like nine years since the last book came out, or the, since the last San Jose Earthquakes book came out. And uh, that book, you know, was a uh, kind of like a narrative literary journey that ended right as our new stadium was opening in 2015. So um, now that the club is going to celebrate 50 years, I just needed to celebrate with them and go on my own journey to research the entire last 50 years, most of which I've been present, you know, for the, you know, the history of it and celebrate in my own way. So I'm glad that you're still doing this. <laughs> well, me too. I, you know, the, the NASL is always near and dear to my heart. And, um, and the earthquakes were, I think in many respects, uh, uh, almost uh, uh, under-recognized. Uh, people forget that in the 70s, uh, as the NASL was in the midst of uh, trying to uh, truly re rebirth itself from uh, near extinction in the very early part of the decade. I mean, the San Jose earthquakes in 1974, when they first came on the scene, were uh, and for the couple couple of years thereafter, were looked looked upon as actually the shining example of what a pro soccer franchise in the NASL had in store for us. This is even before Pele came and all that kind of stuff. I mean, Tampa Bay and San Jose were kind of like not only did they rhyme, but they were like literally giving the NASL true true opportunity for the uh, for the next for the next opportunity there yeah i agree completely you know and um it's great to hear somebody um outside of san jose say that okay because <laughs> um you know nowadays you know many of the fans that you see at the games now you know don't even know what happened five years ago okay let alone you know 50 years ago you know and um i think um that was all the more reason to write another book, you know, um, as soon as I realized, or maybe a year ago, as soon as it became apparent that the uh, current team was going to be celebrating its 50th anniversary, uh, or 50 years since 1974, um, and they were going to be taking it seriously, as they should, then, you know, I think um, it was more than time, more than long overdue to finally uh, put together a you know, um, a series of time capsules, you know, going year by year from 74 all the way until now, because, you know, there's so many people, especially in, uh, well, there's so many people in, throughout the country that who know what the NASL is, but they sort of always talk about it like it's a separate story than the current journey okay and in many cities it is a separate story okay you know in los angeles and new york it's a separate story you know the teams you see right now are not they have nothing to whatsoever to do with anything that happened in the 70s okay you know but um in san jose's case it is all the same story you know everything led to everything else you can easily go year by year all the way from 74 until now and you see every, how everything led to everything else and, you know, um, the original club, you know, sort of, you know, petered out in 1988. And then the league at that time gave another franchise to uh, Dan Van Voorhees, who started the San Francisco Bay Blackhawks. And then that team 
the business was eventually sold uh, to uh, MLS so they could help create the first San Jose MLS team. And then that's pretty obvious from what has happened from there onward to now. And everything did lead to everything else. And no, it isn't the same, you know, continuous franchise for 50 years in a business sense. But there's only a couple of moments where the bloodline really breaks or you could argue that the bloodline really breaks. And, it, and it's a killer history. It's an idiosyncratic, you know, a gloriously idiosyncratic type of history in the sense that all the stuff that this club and this sport has had to overcome and this city and this city is a place where it's already where most of the history is already kind of ignored and not talked about and you know and it only exists underneath the surface of the everyday san jose experience you know so this club's and its journey is a perfect example of something that should just be normalized and finally you know and never forgotten yeah, look, and we can be kind of clinical on this silly little show and all our our, our specific focus, right? On on yeah. what we call sort of retroactive continuity or retcon, right? And yeah. and the earthquakes, you know, so a couple of things. Number one, the earthquakes probably are uh, a, a, a grand example of how uh, the uh, the fits and starts and and the terminals and the beginnings again. And the borrowing yeah. of name and the in, re reincarnations and those kinds of things can play out. However, and I think to your point, um, it is. Uh, I think it's uh, very helpful to know, and this book does a, a grand job of doing this uh, in a very accessible way. You don't have to. This is not like you have to be sort of a, a researcher at heart here to sort of enjoy and understand pretty quickly the story. There are seeds and roots. And uh, diversions, but yes, indeed, I don't think it's a stretch. Uh, you might have to squint once in a while, but I, I, it is. It does feel continuous in the context by which you 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 bring this story together. And I would even argue that yes, while the earthquakes are the dominant name in various forms of this story, this is also literally a story of soccer in. The city and the region, you know, there's a little bit of WPS in there. There's a little bit of the Western Soccer Alliance in there. There's a little bit of there's a little bit of, of t teams not called San Jose. They were called Golden Bay for a while, but the, all of it is still the ter ter terrifically sewn together. There is absolutely a thread. I don't think the thread is ever unbroken once you understand the full magnitude of the story. Yeah, I mean, it's. Um... And it's, it, I mean, anywhere else in the world, or I mean, I shouldn't say anywhere, but Europe or Latin America in particular, okay, is filled with clubs that are much, much older and who are obsessively documenting their histories and where the league itself doesn't generally fold or dissolve or go away, okay, and thus there is no, you know, ambiguity about what is being continued or not, okay, you know. You know, like if the premiership, you know, suddenly, hypothetically speaking, if the premiership right now suddenly folded or went away or dissolved and all the player contracts were gone, okay, you wouldn't see Manchester United just say, okay, well, that's it. We give up. It's over. Okay, No, they would carry on the tradition somehow. They would riot in the streets to save the history of the, the club and the statistics and everything else, right? I mean, you'd think they would, Okay. You know, but in the U.S., we have a unique situation where it's still a fledgling sport to some degree, you know, so we don't have a hundred straight continuous years of the same league existing. OK, which is why a lot of people who have been around for 50 years will tell you stuff like, well, yeah, OK, the, the club is the history. OK, you know, players come and go. Coaches come and go, general managers come and go, and, you know, owners come and go. And in the case of the United States, even leagues have come and gone. OK, but what manages to endure is the history and the the club and everything else, you know, and um, and I'm not the one making this up. You know, this is just how it's happened and how it's unfolded, you know, and it's a, and especially in San Jose's case, it really is a multi-generational family of stuff that has evolved here. I mean, they were, they were having reunions. They had a reunion in 1984. Okay. First of all, <laughs> they had, a, they had a 10 year reunion in 1984. Okay. Now I was there 
Okay, nobody, I mean, I was only like, you know, three and a half feet tall, okay, but I was there, okay, you know, and nobody at that point knew that there were going to be more reunions for the next 40 years, okay, but they had a reunion in 84, they had a reunion in 89, uh, George Best came to both of those, you know, and, um, and it just kept happening, and I think where the inflection point really became obvious was, um, you know, well, aside from San Jose having the first MLS game, they launched the whole league here, you know, basically within a five minute walk from where I'm sitting, you know, at Spartan Stadium. OK, you know, and when the 20 year anniversary of that team was 2016. OK, so 2016, here is the entire 1996 San Jose Clash team brought out at halftime and you had everybody there. You had, I mean, and pretty much everybody that I can remember was there. And now, so this was a point where now even MLS can claim 20th anniversary reunion weekends, okay? And that is still, for those of us that are old, you know, that's still kind of hard to wrap our heads around. But again, you know, and it's, and it's, that all happened here in San Jose, you know? So that was like the next inflection point to show that, yeah, the current week is old enough now to do these things and care about history and all of that. So that was a killer inflection point. And um, it really is a great history and it deserves to be celebrated, you know, and um, it's just great to hear people like you that have, uh, you know, an appreciation for the history to want to talk about stuff like this. Cause it's really hard to get the fan, the younger fans, yeah, you, know, you know, you're talking about a whole different type of fan these days. You know, everybody just or a huge amount of people just want to see the rock star players and they want to know who's going to get signed, you know, and especially um, with the Quakes, you know, they've been relatively mediocre for the last several years, you know, so um, and it's easy to get frustrated. But, you know, and I think history just enriches the club. I mean, it really does, you know, and um you know, and even though Vancouver, Seattle and Portland have the same similar type of lineage and timeline to celebrate, uh, I don't, in my opinion, I don't think they have as rich of a multi-generational family that we have here because there are always people getting together, you know, and um, I think Metallica said something recently like, like, OK, well, as far as we're concerned, as far as our band is concerned, every year is now an anniversary of something. OK, you know, and that's what it feels like, you know, but that, that makes it more fun, you know. Yeah, look, I, th I think actually that's a really good point. I think that the uh, the Quakes, the name and 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 how far back it goes, frankly, uh, along with um, uh, the bulk of the, the three teams in the Pacific Northwest, I think they're actually very similar in terms of their. Uh, legitimacy in terms of of claiming uh, that 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 culture that history, even if it weren't, even if it wasn't, you know, straight line all the time, right? I mean, you mentioned the clash, right? I was at that game, that first game. I think we talked about that last time we spoke. Um, remember it vividly, obviously the Eric Winalda goal near the end of the uh, of the game, and 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 you know, in the tight confines of the uh, of, of of the Spartan Stadium at the time, and 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 I don't think anybody in that crowd, whether they had been an original Earthquakes fan or in the stands for that that adventure back in the old NASL or were new to the the new league, um, didn't think or didn't feel uh, some aspect of what was beforehand. Soccer was played at the stadium, and it was the Earthquakes. And I don't think anybody who hadn't even even known about the NASL did not know about the Earthquakes prior to that. And And the fact that they were called the Clash for a bunch of years, I mean, I think it's, you know, while the name was different and it was a brand new franchise and a brand new league, there's no question that that, that a whole bunch of people that were part of the Quakes uh, 1.0 were very in instrumental in not only uh, the, the launch of that of the second version of, of the franchise known as The Clash, but um, arguably uh, were the reasons for it because of the soul and the location and what had come beforehand. Yeah, I agree completely, you know, and it, it's obvious to us or to those of us that grew up with it, you know, it's obvious that everything led to everything else. And um, if you want to use, you know, Buddhist terminology, you know, all phenomena arise due to the coming together of previous phenomena, you know, I mean, if 
You know, I mean, you know, if, if not for the country of the former Yugoslavia, we, we, we wouldn't have Milan Mandrich and he wouldn't have started the team in the first place. OK, you know, I mean, but you can go as far back as you want. OK, but I mean, everybody I mean, I was at that game too, the first MLS game. And, you know, every single person who was there that that had grown up in the 70s and had known the original team understood the clash as a logical continuation of everything that we had grown up with. I think everybody knew that it's, a, it was just a matter of, you know, so many people not knowing how the league was going to succeed or if it would succeed or why is it called the clash or what, I mean, Bridgewater wanted to call it the earthquakes, the league wouldn't let them, you know? Um, and, you know, and he, we, that, and later on they changed the name back for, probably all the wrong reasons, but it doesn't matter. Okay. I mean, it was the right decision just for maybe, you know, but, um, um, but, you know, so I mean, everybody understood it as a logical continuation and, um, and, and, and MLS now, if you ask anybody involved, if you ask anybody who was there, all the original executives, you know, like uh, Doug Logan and Kevin Payne and all those guys, even Rothenberg, they all wanted to, you know, distance themselves from the failures of the NASL. And that for that's understandable completely. But I think in retrospect, if they had it over again, yeah, they absolutely would have started the league with San Jose and Seattle and Vancouver and Portland and everything else. And that would have made it a lot stronger of a league, you know, first of all. But, you know, that's hindsight is twenty twenty. But, you know, it was it's abs it's pretty obvious that everything led to everything else. And um, I think people were just, you know, didn't know if the league was going to survive or people were jockeying for their jobs and everything. So people may have argued otherwise. But um, and the, the only the only uh, resistance, I think, was that there were some ego trips involved where people were really attached to the old earthquakes and they didn't think that this new league was, should be able to claim that name or not, you know, but all of this is moot now. Everybody loves the name. I mean, nobody, you know, anybody who knows the history understands where it came from. And, well, you um, you, you got to remember know. too, sorry, you got to remember too, that the, the, the folks behind MLS Rothenberg et al were, uh, were, <laughs> they, they were absolutely scared out of their gourds about, reminding people that there was a failed league prior to that, even though Rothenberg yeah, was yeah. instrumental and, and, and elemental in, in the the founding of, of the original NASL with his, his antics with the U S uh, United States, United soccer association, et cetera. But nobody wanted to remember every, I think everybody through that lens, right. It was, Hey, the world cup of 94, a smashing success. We, yeah. We've got the blessing of the, the world is paying attention. Now we got to get this right. And we're not going to repeat the, the the mistakes of the past. And I think it's weird yeah. because people automatically went to, oh, the NASL failed. And obviously through time, right, we've gone back and there was so much that was foundational for what exists today from the NASL. And so much, frankly, that was actually good and novel and and intriguing about the sport and the league and the times of the, you know, that uh, I just, I think most people kind of didn't, remember or want to remember that part it was always the it didn't work so we're not going to do the same thing so it doesn't fail again yeah and from a business sense that makes all the sense in the world you know i understand that you know um and there is a lot to that about the nasl that i mean that it's hard to figure out what hasn't already been told a hundred times but you know like the cosmos story I, everybody knows the story now i mean that was like they were like the Real Madrid of their time. Okay. If you think of like everything that Real Madrid is now or any team like that, the global powerhouse multi-zillionaire team, well, the Cosmos invented that. Okay. There was no such thing as a global team like that before this, you know, and the story has been well told in books and movies and all that. But you know, at the same time, the quakes were like the anti-cosmos. Okay, they were like the 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 work, the complete working class team who never even had their own stadium, barely had a locker room, barely had a training facility. You know, you'd be out there in the parking lot, and the players would come have you know food with you after the game. You know, I mean, it was a complete polar opposite from the cosmos. They were absolutely the anti-cosmos, and there's still a lot of that that 
prevails in the team's attitude today. You know, I mean, we don't need any. And then the song that Lars Fredrickson wrote, you know, Lars from Rancid. I mean, it's a, it's a perfect theme song because it totally plays on all that. Like, we don't want any freaking rock uh, movie stars on this freaking club. Okay, that's what is this? A, this is a real team with real history. It wasn't manufactured yesterday. Now, that doesn't mean that it should be a third rate pub team with no budget forever. Okay. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. But, but it really, there really has a long grassroots working class history that can be expanded on. It doesn't, but you know, the whole idea of it being the anti cosmos or in this case, the anti LAFC or anti galaxy is really, it still totally prevails. You know, and you can probably ask any of those players we have now, and they would probably say something like that, you know, um, you know, and just to, not to beat up on LAFC or anything, you know, but um, here's an example of a team, a club that the league basically manufactured from scratch. And then they manufactured the fan base from scratch. And then they handed the team to the fan base and said, said, OK, there's your club. OK, you know. And um, they didn't, none of the fans had to grow up with it. None of the fans had to work for it. None of the fans had to fight in order to stop it from being relocated, you know, okay. Now, and it doesn't mean that the fans are, you know, illegitimate, okay, or anything, but I mean, it's, but it's just, it's just different, you know? So the Quakes have always had this kind of like, you know, deeply rooted grassroots, historical working class kind of vibe. And the only thing that they don't have is just a little more money to you know you know keep signing players and com compete with the people you know the other clubs you know and all that stuff but well history I, 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 history enriches the club you know and, and it should be celebrated that's the book you know no i and i agree i think i think the the word that uh, that you haven't said is authenticity right and i would argue that vancouver and portland and seattle and certainly san jose lay true direct lineage claim to that perhaps more than any other set of franchises uh in major league soccer perhaps st louis will get there yeah um, you know i i but i you know dallas probably doesn't um and there are a few others where you can kind of maybe you know atlanta has done a fairly decent job although that there was a, the the gap there has been it was relatively large but but I, I think you you look at those four franchises and i think but let me actually let's let's step back for a second so for those who didn't hear our Previous episode back in in twenty late twenty seventeen, I urge you to to give a listen and obviously get a copy of the original book uh, as well with with Gary from Gary. But um, th this though, I, I think, and maybe this also is a little bit about why you and this story are so intertwined. Um, this is also really a story about a city, right? In the yeah. shadow of the two bigger ones in the Bay Area. You know, the 1974, right, when the earthquakes came about and Dick Berg and friends, you know, putting it all together, you know, this was a this was a city that was pretty much unknown to most people around the country. Yet it was booming and bereft of the allure and the attention and certainly anything related to the arts and sports. Um, and in many respects, right, a, a team like this, even if it was in a fledgling league like the NASL. Was a was a was a legitimizer, right? It's the old pro sports yeah. brings, you know, pro level feeling to a city. Yeah, you know, and it that's all of this is true, you know. And well, even when the Oakland Raiders, long before I was born, okay, even when the Oakland Raiders first started, okay. You know, the football uh, big wigs did not want that to happen because they didn't think anybody had heard of Oakland. Okay, you know, I mean, so it's the you know, um, you know, so in 74, you know, the history in a nutshell is, you know, Milan Mandrich and Dick Berg, they, they wanted to create San Jose's first professional, major professional sports franchise. They didn't want to be another team in San Francisco or Oakland, you know, and and that's what they did. And when we when my generation was growing up, you know, um, every, you know, San Francisco had the Giants and the Niners, Oakland had Oakland had the Raiders and the A's and we had the earthquakes, you know, there nobody anywhere viewed it as a less major of a sport than football or baseball or you know it was just um 
In those days, where you know the 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 A's won the World Series three years in a row, the, then the then the um, Warriors won the NBA championship, and then the uh, you know then the Raiders won the Super Bowl. So there was a lot going on in the Bay Area, you know, and um, and San Jose had never seen anything like this in its own city. You know, um, we could sub. I mean, you could open the newspaper the only news the only news source that there was was tv and the newspaper and you could all of a sudden see san jose in the standings in a league a nationwide league with vancouver dallas chicago and new york and you know no one in san jose had ever seen that before (laughs) okay you know so it seems strange now but um and then the league folded in 2000 or 1985, but then the Quakes kept playing anyway. See, this is the other important thing. You know, just because the lead, the lot, you know, just because the league folded doesn't mean the team has to stop playing. Okay, you know, why not just you know fill out the roster with whatever is left, and then go find some other teams that are doing the same thing, and that's what they did. Okay, and then that continued that attitude continued until. The Blackhawks took over, and then they continued in one form or another until MLS started. You know, so it's um the reason why it's so janky of a disconnected history is just because um the league hasn't been consistent. Okay, whereas anywhere else in the world, you see teams that might be go broke, but the league is always there. Okay, you know, in the United States, that's been the uh, the the only major discontinuity is that the league it hasn't been the same league for 50 straight years you know so people get confused and they don't think that the history is connected when it really is connected so but they the quakes put this town on the map originally um it didn't last as long you know and then a lot of other things came along in between then and now but you know but it's just it's killer history that should be celebrated All right, what's this? OldSchoolShirts.com. Fantastic. You've heard me talk on and on and on about the great folks and the great wares at OldSchoolShirts.com. Like the name implies, it's old school and it's shirts, and they put them together, see, into what they call OldSchoolShirts.com. It's like the name implies, but of course, we love them primarily uh, for their sports wear. You name the league of the past you name the team of the past the chances are huge that they're going to have more than one shirt and different color schemes for things that you may remember from the united football league or the major indoor soccer league or various flavors of the original xfl's uh, plural or the federal league perhaps or maybe world team tennis or maybe it was the north american soccer league and on and on and on But, hey, it's not just sports. It's also great cultural touchstones and memories from the past. How about the officially licensed Evil Knievel connection? Connection? How about collection? Yeah, that's what he's trying to say. Uh, Various colleges. How about dead malls of the past? Ice cream parlors. Maybe even radio stations that you might remember. Hey, even there's a latest edition of the old, now old, Aloha Stadium commemorative shirt. All that kind of stuff and more. You will find at least a handful of shirts that you will just transport you back into your past and you will amaze and impress your friends at the same time. It's oldschoolshirts.com. And we got a promo code for you, of course. Let's save you some dough while you go there. And it's uh, promo code is good seats. Good seats. That's the promo code at oldschoolshirts.com. Promo code good seats for 10% off all of your purchases. Hey, P.F. Wilson and your friends at OldSchoolShirts.com, thank you for your sponsorship of the show. And now, back to our conversation. It is, as we've talked about in our previous conversation, almost like a, a story kind of in in three acts. I mean, what we've been kind of uh, uh, circling around is sort of that first one, right? which was 74 until about 1988, when in the wake of the the the, uh, uh, the breakup of the NASL, you had uh, this Western Soccer Alliance and some other sort of smaller, you know, entities, uh, you know, fumfering on uh, trying to keep the name, the earthquakes thing and pro- frankly, pro soccer alive. Yeah. Um, 
But then there's this gap, right, from 1988 until the rebirth, if you will, of, of in this case, Major League Soccer in 1996, right? So this is not just a gap that um, that San Jose had to endure. And obviously there was semi-pro and there were lots of, you know, little uh, tentacles, if you will, that were still around keeping keeping everything kind of, you know, afloat. And, and um, but uh, this was also something that that many followers of the NASL were experiencing all over the country. And as, as a Cosmos fan, right, same thing in New York, felt like a, a gut punch, right? Because like all of a sudden, this is league and everything. And then all of a sudden, boom, nothing, like literally nothing, especially except for, you know, some smaller semi-pro, much more, you know, much more modest approaches. Uh, arguably, they they took the mantle of Division One soccer, but it was a mere shell of what the NASL had been previously, right? So this, I think in any major NASL market, right? Um, and and the, the ones in the Pacific Northwest as well, too, felt very, I think people felt betrayed. Um, the fact that that pro soccer was gone. And I think that also added to the allure and the excitement of 94 World Cup and then the the guarantee that there was going to be a new league on top of that after, you know, in the aftermath. Um, I, I'm curious, having you, you know, you being in the in the market during that time, um, when when the 94 World Cup rolled around and you heard the first inklings of a new pro league, um, what was the what was the scuttlebutt in the San Jose area? Was it just assumed that San Jose would get one or would it be like, wait a minute, we got to get to work and remind people that San Jose was a great soccer market in the past. We got to make sure that it's part of it when it's uh, relaunched again. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, At that time I was in college and I was not yet a journalist, so I wasn't really um, following the, 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 micro level details of it but we those of us who had grown up with it and had been through everything so up to that point and we knew that okay bridgewater peter bridgewater was in charge of the stanford stadium venue for the world cup um he had Lori callaway working with him former earthquakes and blackhawks coach and um and um and dan van Voorhees. Uh, the owner of the Blackhawks, he was the one leading the the bid committee w- to bring uh, a franchise here when MLS started, and that was successful. That's what happened. So, um, as far as you know, there were a lot of skeptics. In fact, most people were skeptical. You know, um, and but I think anybody, any diehard, I'm sorry, uh, of the league or San Jose being part of the league or both. Uh, no, of, of whether the league, whether any league was going to happen and survive or not. Okay, I mean, I mean, we were uh, San Jose was pretty much always going to be one of the founding uh, cities. I think um, that. I mean. I mean, Dan Van Voorhees had owned the Blackhawks, 89, 90, 91, 92. And at that time, they were pretty much the best team in the country, more or less. And they turned into like like a micro version of the Cosmos of that small league. You know, they were spending over well, way out of proportion to anybody else. But there was no other way to build a nationwide league at that point. And he had all sorts of visions to build a, a – he even talked about it. He wrote templates and all sorts of ideas for how to build a Division One level league across the entire country. He had the vision. He actually was trying to get the Mexican League to play games against uh, the American teams, you know, like you see going on with the League's Cup now. He was talking about all of this 30 years ago. Okay, and so he was the one leading the San Jose bid along with a whole bunch of other people, you know, since he had the team, the Blackhawks, and they were playing at Spartan Stadium, and he had all the, and he had the player contracts and the rights to to play at Spartan. So all of that is what essentially, you know, convinced everybody else that San Jose would be a a good move to be one of the founding uh, clubs. So that was, so that was successful. And, um, it was a pretty strong proposal, you know, and, um, but as far, you know, and, and having a world cup here at that time was great. You know, I mean, I went to all the Stanford games and, um, the Brazil USA on 4th of July and that year, 94, which is now 30 years ago. I mean, cough, cough, <laughs> you know, well, come um, on. And we got, we got the, we got the cup coming back in two years. So that's even going to be yeah, even yeah. more than that. 
Yeah. So there's got so there's a lot of history here, and 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 the, and the initial executives of MLS, everybody, you know, Rothenberg, everybody else knew that San Jose would be a good would be a good. I don't know if they all agreed that the first game should be here, but everybody agreed that sort of you know that this would be a good place to have a team because of Van Voorhees' connections and the history here, and and they had the rights to play in the stadium, you know, and all that stuff. And the players, he had all the players that could be then, you know, distributed throughout the rest of the league, which is basically what happened. But the first clash team, 96, 97, you know, the half of that team was basically from the Blackhawks, you know. So so it was a good – it was a great way to continue the history, you know. Yeah, and look, and, and also – go ahead. No, and you mentioned like the you know that there was a gap. Okay, you know I don't we we don't the people who were here don't perceive that don't understand the existence of any gap that really happened. And you know what I'm trying to show in the new book is that there is a linear progression. Everything led to everything else, and that there was there may have been a gap in the sense that there wasn't a full blown nationwide league you know going on for several years, but there was absolutely still activity. There were still lots of uh, Blackhawks games. There were still Bridgewater was doing all sorts of high level international games here in late 80s, early 90s. And he's the one who made or mo mostly he's the one who made the Stanford venue happen, you know, so so professionally speaking, you know. So there was a no, lot a going true, on true, here. No, a true firekeeper, no doubt. And and I think yeah. actually that 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 mimics some of the other uh, markets as well. Certainly yeah. Seattle for sure. Uh, yeah, definitely. The A-League and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, all right. But um, I, it's also interesting too, Spartan Stadium, maybe a, a minute or two about that because um, yeah. it's it was, I think to any uh, NASL fan uh, who saw games uh, from afar like I did on Channel 9 watching Cosmos games and yeah, the yeah. national game and stuff, and even uh, in the uh, MLS version with the clash, uh, then uh, coming to becoming the the earthquakes of a second nature, uh, would uh, would look at it a kind of a, a, that stadium as uh, almost lovingly because it it almost I don't want to call it the the archetype perhaps of what a soccer specific stadium might want to look like, but I, I guess I would 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 call it cozy, and it, it felt smaller and more intimate maybe than most. Uh, stadiums that were envisioned for MLS and and the 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 grandiosity that was the World Cup prior to that, and I think you had something special both in the NASL and going into MLS with, if you will, that that relatively cozy stadium. Yeah, I agree completely, and you know, and and nobody ever claimed that it was a luxurious place okay <laughs> you know or, I mean, or even maybe full size but then again ohio yeah. stadium wasn't a full size either yeah. for the crew but i digress yeah you know and they, they have what they call luxury boxes nothing is luxury at, at, or at, at that time okay um they've since remodeled a little bit of it okay but um you know and it was our and you know especially i mean Anyone who grew up there, and especially at, at anyone my generation, is when MLS started, it was like, yeah, you were in the stands watching the games as an adult in the same stands where you grew up watching the same, you know, the same sport and the same, some of the same people. I mean, some of the same people cleaning the bathroom were there in the 70s. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, I mean, there were a lot of people that you know continued on and you know it wasn't just the on in the in the in the at the the soccer players and the and the front office staff or anything there was a lot of ways that you could easily connect it all up and it was a great place to grow up and it was never i mean you could argue that it was a ramshackle you know dump of a stadium but it's like one of those things like you know i mean it was like our cbgbs or of soccer or something you know so I mean, it was like our little, you know, it had been there since the 30s and we we had grown up with it. Um, it was not our stadium. It was the college football program's stadium. OK, it belonged to them. You know, we were just using it, you know, but um, there were a lot of memories there. And, yeah, it was way too narrow and it was like playing indoor soccer for a lot of people. But it made a lot of it made every visiting team just hate to play there and that was and to a degree that was just fun to watch you know yeah that's called home field advantage and, and that right. intimacy i think you know 
in a backhanded way, almost just sort of like a, a hint, frankly. And I, th- I think, frankly, if you pressed some of the uh, uh, major league soccer officials over the years would would sort of uh, agree with this logic that, hey, you know, maybe this idea of soccer specificity, um, you know, I, San Jose was probably the best piece of evidence of how something like that could look and feel. And I don't know, that's I'll squint and, and make that argument. Yeah, I mean, even today, I mean, you know, even today, you know, if you go, I mean, just uh, well, going back to when MLS started, you know, you're, I mean, we're it's 1996. Yes, you can you can argue all sorts of ways about what you know how they're going to make the league work, okay? But you're in this, this you're in Spartan Stadium, okay? George Best played there. Uh, Diego Maradona came there with Napoli in 1985 and went for an exhibition game. So Maradona played on that field. Okay. Pele played on that field twice. Um, Eusebio came there. Um, I don't think Johan Cruyff came there. I think he, we didn't play him at home those couple of years, but you know, this is like world soccer royalty has come as walked down that ramp onto that field. Okay. You know, and I'd rather play in a point now again, but it's, it wasn't sustainable long-term, you know, they had to, it wasn't, it didn't belong to the quakes and, um, and, you know, there's no, you know, you can't bring your, your millionaire corporate friends to sit in that place forever, you know, but so there were reasons why they needed to go somewhere else, but for that, it will, it will always carry a lot of history for people like me. Cause there was just so many, and that's where, and those are the years that we won the championships, you know, those are the year, the, the four years Landon Donovan was here. It was on that field. You know, I got to sit there, and watched Landon Donovan, you know, the, who at the time was the best player that the United States had. Um, I got to see him on the same field where I saw George Best score that goal, you know, 20 years earlier, which was before Landon was even born, for example. Okay, you know, um, and so there's the hist- this is why people like me love history. We're just nerds about history and we think that, and it, it, it really does enrich the club, you know. Um, and again, it's not to say that, you know, the journey of the current moment is unimportant. Okay. Nobody's saying that, you know, the priority shouldn't be, you know, making sure the current team is good also. Okay. We're not, you know, but history just enriches the club, you know, and I I do believe that, you know, like look at St. Louis, for example, they haven't had a club for that long, but the whole damn history, the whole city is already celebrating the the rich history of, of, of soccer in that city, which goes way farther than San Jose has, has ever contributed, you know, and their history in that city goes back like a hundred years at least, you know, and they get it. The fans there get it. Okay. You know, so. Yeah. And, and longer and, suffering for sure. So that's, that's a, that's a, that's yeah, a, that's a, a longer a suffering. Larger- yeah, yeah, much larger fly cast, though, to go all the way that uh, back and stuff. But but arguably, they've got the opportunity to kind of, shall we say, rewrite their history and and gloss over, I guess, those many decades where they weren't at the top, maybe the steamers and the MISL for a bunch of years. But but OK, so let, let, let me zone in, though. So you're mentioning those those two championships and uh, seasons 2001 and 2003. Uh, they, they actually finished 2005 with the what is now known as the. Uh, Supporter Shield, essentially the first in the in the league then and stuff. And um, I, I, it would be really interesting, I think, for current generational fans of this team to maybe understand why they wound up leaving for Houston after the 2005 season. I mean, you're describing a team that for the years prior to that were uh, doing very well, especially on the field. They were doing not so bad on the, on the in the stands as well. That's not a bad thing. Um, but you know, two championships, uh, two supporter shields. Um, they, you know, didn't, uh, they only made the quarterfinals in the playoffs in 2005, but this is the stadium issue, right? There was, there was a, a beef about where they were going to continue to play. Maybe a little bit of background about the story there and Spartan stadium and why that wasn't what league officials were hoping that San Jose's, uh, home should look like in the years ahead. Um, I don't think it was the league officials on um, basically um, well, it, the Anschutz Entertainment Group or who wound up operating the Quakes for those years. And uh, I guess we have with to a bunch of other teams, by the way, which is also another part yeah. of the story, right? Yeah, we have to go back a couple of years. OK, basically, you know, the league started in 96 
after the 2001 season, after the Quakes won the championship, okay, after that season, MLS was already completely broke and verging on bankruptcy, and they all and the league almost folded altogether. Um, this is not secret. I mean, everybody, it's all been told now. Okay, but so and, be, and to, to prevent the league from folding altogether, AG and uh, Lamar Hunt uh, uh, operation and you know the Robert Kraft you know syndicate you know all three of them had to basically step up and become the the, the investor operators of multiple teams. Okay, so that's what saved the league from going under more or less. Okay, so at this point. Um, you know, the Sharks came in to help own and operate or to help invest and operate the team, the Quakes for a, a couple of years. But then when they didn't, they had their own ownership uh, issues going on. So they had to pull out. And then um, AEG was left as the sole investor operator of the Quakes. And they, um, at this point, their attitude was, well, we started this league. We helped bankroll everything we're going to do whatever we want and you know if we want to move the team to alaska we're going to do that and there's nothing mls is going to do to stop us and you know that's and this is true okay you know because they had basically helped save the league at this point so they ag is they didn't want to be here at all in this market they didn't know anything about it they didn't care um <clears throat> the local political administration at that time didn't really care either you know, so AEG just figured, well, in Houston, there's a huge television market watching MLS games. And for a city that doesn't yet have a team, there's a pretty huge television market there. The ratings are good and the land is cheaper and we can probably partner with somebody else and find somebody else to throw in a whole bunch of money to build a stadium a lot easier than we can in San Jose. So they wanted to move as soon as they became in charge of, you know, San Jose. And um, they even threw around San Antonio for a potential a place to move originally. And then, um, so, and then after the 2005 season was over, they basically pulled the trigger and did that. They took the team to Houston and then the fans in San Jose fought to keep the history here. Um, this is very important. Fan, the fans in San Jose, fought MLS and said, okay, if you're going to move the team, you're going, we are telling you that you are going to leave the history here, the records here and the statistics here in case you do bring back a, a team of some sort. And then, and then it will be continued. Okay. And then, and so that's what happened. You know, they pulled like a Cleveland Browns kind of scenario and the fans in San Jose are who fought to make that happen. It would never have happened otherwise. Yeah, this is so. this is interesting because we've seen this in especially in hockey, uh, where, yeah. for example, the Minnesota North Stars, right? Yeah, yeah. on paper, right, uh, or or legitimately, right, all that history should be in Dallas. Yet there was an unwinding of the team prior to that, where some parts of it wound up uh, helping start the the Sharks in San Jose. Yeah, but the people in St. Paul, once the uh, the Wild came about as a new expansion franchise, right? Anybody you talk to in that story would to a person say the history stays here. Yeah. And I, it, it, and I, I see it a lot with Quebec. You see it with, uh, 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 uh Winnipeg, uh, the jets for sure. The same thing. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, and, and I get, you know, from a business perspective, it makes a ton of sense, uh, both in terms of logo merch and all that kind of stuff. But frankly, from a history and, and, uh, credibility perspective, the soul right of that, tends to sort of stay in in and around that 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 um uh that that original label logo and 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 all of that stuff right so it becomes a very weird game when you're trying to historically uh root and um you know uh, give credit to where these uh, histories should live and you know I think anybody coming in from outer space that doesn't understand the history of the MLS right uh, yeah, yeah. would say, well, you know, Houston, the Houston franchise was the old Santa and they're not wrong, but the soul, right, is is still there. And, and you have to give the fans then credit for, I guess, for a couple of years holding on to, I don't know what, like boxes of memories. I don't know. Well, that's what it felt like. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it really felt like moving the team was an act of violence. That's real. And I say that in the book. Now, I'm not claiming AEG was violent okay i'm just saying it really felt like 
an act of violence. Like, you know, we grew up and we fought to keep this team here or the sport here. And then nobody believed in us. And now the last person left holding it just takes it somewhere else, you know, and sure we have a team back now, but it really truly felt like, and this is all taking place right when AEG also owns the galaxy and the galaxy state brand new stadium, which was then called the home Depot center was being touted you know, ad nauseum over and over as the future of MLS in terms of, you know, Hollywood style facilities, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then they, get rid of or they basically come out of their, what it felt like was they were intentionally trying to destroy all of the San Jose earthquakes history and put put us out of our misery just so they could concentrate on building up their glory franchise in Los Angeles okay that's what it felt like, like I'm not saying that's what happened that's what it felt like okay <laughs> you know there's a serious sense of abandonment that you know was going through the minds of everybody here you know so and the ironic thing is that and Throughout that whole era, MLS was bending over backwards to prop up, you know, the Galaxy as this marquee franchise and their stadium as this marquee stadium. And then as soon as the whole idea to do LAFC happened, they they gave up on that. And now they're they're using LAFC as their model franchise and all. And then people have kind of forgotten that the whole the Galaxy Stadium is way out in suburban wasteland America. You know, it's not in LA, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I mean, who would trust these guys in the first place? Okay. This is why it's more fun to grow up with a uh you know, a grassroots, you know, working class team that people have fought for for generation and generation and are still fighting for, you know. That's just my personal opinion. Okay, it's no, not, that, that, not yeah. and that's why I'm asking it because you you, you, <laughs> you are speaking this as a, as both a fan, but also somebody who's who's like in the in the area know, and knows the story both longitudinally as well as uh, you know emotionally, right? Um, I, yeah. So two two questions here. So number one, um, actually, I want to go back and then ask the second one. The, ba- the going back question is the, the the renaming of the clash to. The earthquakes. This is back in nineteen what ninety nine. After what three seasons or so, four seasons. Yeah, yeah, correct. or so. Um, to, for the for, for the uninitiated, and I even I get cloudy on this. Um, you kind of hinted at it before, but uh, good intentions or quick buck or what to change that name. Uh, probably a lo- a little bit of everything. Um, I think uh, in nineteen ninety six. Bridge Peter Bridgewater was the general manager when the clash. Actually, he was named the general manager before we even knew what the name of the team was going to be. Okay, and he had been the, the last general manager of the Earthquakes, the previous Earthquakes. So he wanted to call the team the Earthquakes. The league, would, as far as I know, the league would not let him do that for all the reasons we already talked about they wanted to distance themselves from anything related to a previously failed you know league you know the nasl which is fine that makes business sense. i understand that okay but um so and then they hired and then when the league was starting they um hired you know shoe companies like nike or merchandise companies like nike and adidas and all of that to basically and gave those companies way too much control to brand the entire clubs or the entire franchises, you know? So that's why you wound up with the Kansas city whiz (laughs) and the Dallas burn. Okay. And the San Jose clash, you know, none of which still exists, thankfully, uh, you know, um, and in Chicago, and, all, and what happened in Chicago is basically what inspired. I would, what I believe is what helped inspire the Quakes to come back. You know, in Chicago, what Nike wanted to do was call the club uh, the Chicago Rhythm. I think it was. It was a stupid idea. And then the the, the fans, the citizens, uh, and Peter came back and said, "No, this is BS. We're gonna. We all want to call this the Chicago Fire." because it references a historical fire in Chicago that had everything to do with the growth of the modern city, you know, in the 20th century. Okay. And the, it really resonated with the fans and that's what they wanted. So they defied Nike and said, the hell with you, whatever you want to do, we're going to call this what we want to call it Chicago fire. That was 98. 
So, um, and then I think at that point here in San Jose, I think uh, since the clash was doing terribly and nobody understood what the brand was all about anyway, that it made sense. Okay. Well, if Chicago can go and do that, then we can go and, um, do our own research, you know, and see what the fans really want. And the fans wanted the earthquakes. And yeah, so after yeah, that, compromise after, after, though, right. Cause they didn't go back to the, the, the old logo or the color scheme and stuff, right. So it was kind of a Pyrrhic victory, but, but still a victory nonetheless, because it did, it did throw back to what most fans kind of knew and know was, was legit, like an incredible. Yeah. And then, um, so this is the end of the 99 season. Okay. So Don, so Garber is just now becoming the commissioner. So he, and he understood that this was the right thing to do. So he, you know, came out here and he'd only been on a job like three or four months or something like that. So he went along with it, you know, whereas the previous commissioner wouldn't go along with it. Whereas Garber made that happen and, um, or helped make it happen. And there was still some debate, you know, everybody d- didn't understand the reason for doing it. They just, um, the, our GM at that time, um, Lynn Metroparil, basically is the one who made the decision. And she just decided that, okay, well, the current brand is not working. We want to choose a name that the fans can identify with and the history that the fans can identify with. Now, this is the end of 99. Okay. So I, I, again, still at this point, nobody even knew if the league was going to survive or not. They were basically just trying to keep the lights on. Okay. You know, so, and I don't think it was any kind of radical adherence to history or anything like that. I think she just made a business decision that, you know, the fans could identify with this name rather than some stupid Nike contraption that they had been given, you know, so that's what happened. Um, and the the <laughs> second part of that question, though, then is what of this stadium situation, right? So it was it was definitely dangled right upon departure, right? Was the I, I'm guessing that there was some uh, uh, desire for an eventual solution, quote unquote, beyond Spartan Stadium, and that that didn't help the cause for AEG to quickly, you know, shuttle to the team elsewhere? I know AEG could have afforded to keep the team here for a hundred years. Okay. I don't think, I don't think they really, the the stadium thing was more like an excuse than anything else. Okay. They didn't want to be here. Um, They, they had a phone call that they made to Lou Wolf and, and realized that, okay, if there's, if someone can make, could get a stadium built here, he has a lot of history here going back to the city. 60s is a is a big real estate developer. He can do it. Um, so and they had a conversation with him, and he said, "Yeah, okay, I'll take a look at it." And then when they made the announcement to move the team, it was also announced that he that Lou Wolf was going to be looking into bringing it back. Okay, you know, so I don't think the stadium honestly it, it really had that much to do. I mean, they say it that the, the the excuse was that they could build a stadium in Houston a little easier. You know, but, um, you know, that, that it, it, the stadium was part of it. OK, but, you know, it wasn't I mean, AG did not want to be here. I think everybody pretty much knows that. I mean, they you know, they didn't have anything, any knowledge. of. They didn't think that this San Jose was enough of a market. They they basically said that, you know, and then the political administration here are, are were basically, you know, not big city politicians by any stretch, you know, so a combination of everything it just fell apart. And they said, well, we don't want to deal with this anymore. And they went there and, you know, gave the idea to Lou Wolf and he said, fine, okay, I'll be the one that brings it back. You know? So it took a couple of years, but you know, that's what happened. And how quickly in my, that's my understanding of what happened. No, that's good. You're, you're probably closer than anybody uh, listening to this show would probably uh, 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 be able to, to to that's why we ask the question. So, um, how how long do you do you remember and or do you did you document? Uh, it's obviously about two two or so seasons or years or whatever on paper. But in your estimation, how quickly was the uh, bring us another franchise dynamic 
Uh, how realistic was that and how soon was that? I mean, keeping the name and the franchise and the fans and that kind of stuff certainly didn't hurt. Um, but what, what, what did it take two years and voila, it became a solution again? Or do you think that the seeds were sown pretty early on upon the departure? Well, I think, uh, let me see if I can remember the details here. Um, the team left at, in November of 2005, or AG, that's when AG announced that they were moving to Houston. And then if, if I remember correctly, when Garber was talking about it in the press conference to announce this, uh, he said that I, something like, you know, I just, I had a call with Lou Wolf, you know, and he's going to try and, look into taking out an option to bring a team back. And then the very next year, 2006, uh, they did that. Lou Wolf and John Fisher took an option out, just took the option out to bring a team back, you know. And then I think in 2000, I think it was later that year, 2006, when they basically announced, okay, we're going to exercise the option. It may have been later in 2006 or earlier in 2007. I mean, it's in the book somewhere, okay, but where they 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 exercised the option and said that we are going to bring a team back starting in 2008. So they they were serious, you know. They uh, I don't think they realized how long it would take to actually get the stadium built, you know, but because San Jose is just notorious uh, with, you know, hick town bureaucracies in terms of permits and any kind of stuff like this, you know? So um, I don't think they didn't realize how long it would take, but, or that we would be at Buckshaw stadium for, you know, six or seven years. I mean, they only wanted it to be for a couple of years, you know, but um, they were serious, you know, Supposedly, you know, and they brought it back and then um, and then, you know, as you know, they had just purchased the Oakland A's right before this, you know, so which is now front row and center of the universe, you know, so it's it's uh, amazing the whole, you know, idiotic chess match that, you know, unfolded in regards to all of this, you know. Oh, I want to talk. I want to talk about that in a second. I'm going to use it as a yeah. wrap. Okay, so 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 keep that under wraps for a second. But so just I just want to talk about Buckshaw Stadium for a second. Um, yeah, because I, I it's really interesting to know that I mean one of the preconditions right upon bringing a franchise back right was this uh, uh, agreement, belief, uh, best intentions to uh, create and bring a soccer specific stadium uh, as part of the deal, right? And to your point, right, it took much longer for various reasons. Um, but what was this interim thing? I, I had the uh, the luxury of, of uh, going to a game there and uh, and walking around the campus there. And um, yeah, yeah. talk about intimate, uh, <laughs> hard to believe. But then again, this is when the Chicago Fire were doing the same thing at North Central College around here where they were banning about their own stadium and stuff too. So this was, and Dallas was in a high school stadium for yeah, a year or two, yeah. right? So this was not, actually completely out of the ordinary around this time in MLS, if the stadium was coming, we'll bite the bullet for a couple of years and go into something substandard, but it was kind of neat. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was on one hand, it was embarrassing to be playing in this kind of place because, you know, it's a college stadium and there's not even any locker room. They had to walk off the field and go into the basketball arena and use the locker rooms. OK, I mean, for seven years, this okay, is San, you know. Santa Clara University, correct? Yeah, Santa Clara University. So and, and you know, the press boxes were a complete dump, you know. Um, and, but so and on one hand, it was embarrassing. But, you know, there again at that university, that soccer program has a lot of history. You know, Brandy's husband is, you know, was the coach and, and coached all championships. The guy, the women and the men's programs won several championships, you know, the Broncos, you know, so it wasn't, it, and it was, there was a lot of history there. And it, it really, and even though it was tiny and embarrassing, it really started to grow on people, you know. And we, some of us, okay, you know, it, I mean, it felt like a third division, you know, ground, you know, somewhere in England, somewhere. And it, but, you know, and sure, the team should be a first division marquee freaking franchise, but why are we playing in this place, you know? But so to a degree, it was embarrassing, but to another degree, it, it kind of grew on the fans and it allowed uh, the supporters group, the ultras, to really become the true. 
uh, 12th person. And it was a great environment when the team was good and winning. And 11,000 is not much, but it was um, a great place to just go hang out. And you're, you're, it was like a great third division field somewhere in, in Europe or something, you know, like a neighborhood place. And um, no one thought it would be, you know, let's see, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So seven years we were there. No one thought it was going to be that long, but it just made it all the more spectacular to finally leave the place. Okay. <laughs> you know, so. And but, let's yeah. talk, yeah, let's talk about that final act then, if you will, final, it's not yeah. final, but this final gear shift to uh, what is now known as um, uh, PayPal, uh, well, PayPal Park, right? That's what it's called. Yeah. Um, yeah. The um, world's largest outdoor bar and and that kind of stuff. Uh, very interesting locations, right, right near the airport. Uh, it's 18,000 seats or so. And it's, uh, uh, it, it, I think it's, it's arguably probably one of the more intimate feeling stadiums and, and the way it's built and stuff, um, forgetting the on-field performance of the team. And we'll get to that in our final question. I, I promise. Um, h- how does the uh, fan base feel about finally having its own home and, and how, um, uh, how, uh, how has that, merged with uh, with the history in terms of uh corners and and areas say in the stadium where some of that history might be remembered are there any artifacts and or call outs to the history well that's a great question um i think when the stadium first got built it was it was it was fantastic. Okay. It went so as, as a via, right? A via stadium or. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still a great place to see a, a, a soccer game. Okay. There's not a bad seat in the house. Um, you can walk around the entire perimeter of the whole place in probably 10 minutes. Okay. There's no way to get lost. It's a great 18,000 seat capacity stadium. Okay. But I think at the same time, you know, after a couple of seasons, the novelty began to wear off and that, you know, and the most important thing for the fans is, you know, whether the current team is really is if the current team on the field is mediocre for, you know, five, six, seven years in a row, you know, the fans are going to get irritated and they're going to, you know, not be happy, you know, like, like anybody would. Okay. But, you know, so I think these days you're talking about a whole a whole different type of fan, you know, which is the reason why I'm writing the book is just to show the people that history is something to celebrate. It's not a substitute for how bad the team is currently doing or why they're not signing all the right players or why they're not spending money in a different way than the other teams are spending money or why they, why their budget is not what the you know, LA or New York has or whatever, you know, and the reason for writing the book is to show this, to celebrate the history and show the, the that show people that history does enrich the club, you know, but ultimately if the team sucks for 10 years, it's going to have a lot more importance to the fans, obviously, you know, so the so even as the team, uh, and every I'm friends with every all the executives. Okay, you know, even as they're celebrating the history, they they still need to make sure that this is a a you know a a good team and a competitive team on the field at the same time. You know. So then that leads to the doorstep of the sort of the cul-de-sac here question. So so what of John Fisher, right? What of the ownership group and what has got to be just a gigantic distraction and then some with this just crazy a saga that I don't know is going to play out well uh, at the end of the day. And I'm not rooting for it per se, although I do wouldn't mind the content for the show and the the months and years to come. But um, I I think it, um, I I can't imagine that that fans don't sort of make that leap, that, uh, that, that, that connection between his ownership and, and, um, and the, and the shenanigans that have been going on with the A's and perhaps maybe, its contribution, if you will, to maybe it's the 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 moribund situation that you, that fans find uh, now with the quakes. Totally, I don't I don't I don't know a fan who isn't making the connections. <laughs> okay, you know, um, quakes fans are have every right to be conspiracy theorists about everything. Okay, because so much crap has gone on with this club and this sport. In the history of this town, as I've tried to show in the book, that you know they have every reason to feel like every little 
thing that happens is is going to lead to some abandonment of some sort, you know, or some or something. So the Qu Quakes fans have every right to be pissed off right now because the team has been mediocre for years. Fisher is not the greatest owner in the world. And um, I don't know the guy. I've been in the elevator with him, but I've never had a conversation with him. He goes out of his way to avoid the press completely, you know, the, the media completely, except when he wants to, you know, uh, correct something. I don't know. But, um, but um, I don't, he doesn't come across to me as being a really decent owner. And I don't know anybody that really does like him, but, you know, um, this is who we have. You know, and um, and I, I mean, there are from what I've heard through 20 of generation hearsay is that there are people in or entities in the Bay Area that want, would love to buy the team, but he's not selling it right now. So um, it just we'll have to wait and see what happens. And the whole disaster with the A's, you know, I don't I'm not convinced that's going to happen yet. I mean, it probably will, but it's not, you know. I mean, you know, the way everything has been bungled, you know, so far, I don't, you know, know what's going to happen. So I, 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 just, don't, I, I don't have an answer on that one. I really don't, you know. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't you know where the team's going to play, you know, uh, if the yeah. stadium isn't built in, in Las Vegas, so I, um, but, which is just bizarre. You'd think you'd have to have, you'd think you want those things pinned down or guaranteed, so to speak. Uh, but then again, you know, the story of the earthquakes, the situation was uh, longer than most people expected too. I, I guess it's a very interesting quandary then for fans, right? Because while the ownership might not be well-liked or loved, um, yet you want to see the players uh, uh, do well on the field and compete and, and right, win some right. stuff, right? So in a weird way, right, by doing so uh, may reward bad ownership and vice versa. I don't know. Right. Yeah. And, and the fan, believe me, the fans have been having that conversation for years. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, and the fans just want to be a team that they can be proud of and bring and bring their friends to. And, you know, San Jose is the most ethically diverse place in the whole damn country. OK, I mean, more almost half the people who live here are from somewhere else. OK, you know, and it's a it is the ideal place to have a soccer, a professional soccer franchise, you know, and the history is here. The history, the historical connections with the 49ers are here. Levi's Stadium is here if they want to use a bigger stadium. I mean, if, if they if he would sell a team to the 49ers, that would be that would raise everybody's eyebrows. And it, it might even be a, a great idea. Who knows? I mean, I mean, it would suck for Raiders fans. OK, but I mean, it would there's plenty of good things that could happen, you know, but um, ultimately the fans just want a great team they can go watch and have fun supporting and who isn't going to disappoint them over and over again for year, years and years and years. And it's really difficult, you know, when every other or when many other franchises have 10 times the budget and are signing all these rock star players, you know, and it makes Quakes, it, it just let, it allows Quakes fans to feel a little worse about themselves because we don't have – and it, it, it's easy to compare to other teams when we shouldn't be doing that in the first place. But um, yeah, the quite the fans just want a good team on the field that that will do well and that will fight and, and compete and not, you know, be cobbled together over and over again, year in and year out, you know? So um, I'm with the fans on that one too, but you know, the point of the book is to celebrate the history and it's not to say the history is the only thing to celebrate. And it's not to say that, you know, we should celebrate this and thus not complain about all the problems that are going on. No, no one's claiming that, you know, one's trying to minimize the journey of the current moment. You know, it's, you know, the, the book is just to help celebrate the history, but yeah, I'm with the fans and that, you know, if the team continues to be mediocre year in and year out, they're going to lose the fan base, you know? Yeah, and it's just it's uh, I like you know the the ownership reveals itself right, and um, I'm not sure. Well, who knows what's in Don Garber's head and the the uh, the expansion committee and all that kind of stuff. I, I I don't know. You think it can't happen to the uh, to the Quakes or or I mean if that's you know if that's how ownership looks with a sister. Well, I mean, franchise. I mean the, the the ownership operation. I mean it's it's still it's John Fisher still yeah, but the ownership of the Quakes and the ownership of the. A's is entirely different situation. Okay. I mean, he built the stadium 
the Quake Stadium with his own money. Okay, he got a good deal on the land. Okay, but he built it with his own money. He he you know he's not, and he's there at the games. You know, at most of them. You know, um, so it's a completely different situation than he has with the A's. Okay, so it's very it's it's easy to you know to get paranoid and think that he's going to you know, destroy this you know club also. But it's it's a completely different situation. You know. Um, and the, the Quakes fans just have to remind themselves of this, you know, and, you know, hopefully there is a better day when, you know, I, like we said at the beginning, you know, I mean, players come and go, coaches come and go, general managers come and go, and owners have come and gone and will continue to come and go. And the club will always be here and you know that's and that's the history stays here the history remains and the lineage and the family and the multi-generational family that this team has created for 50 years is what has endured despite all of this and that was the point of writing the book All right, mighty thanks to Gary for that chat. Let's uh, tell you what you need to do. First of all, you got to get the book. It is called The Unforgettable, San Jose Earthquakes, Momentous Stories on and Off the Field. It is published by the History Press, and it is available wherever good books are sold. You want to get it from your independent bookseller, just walk down the street, tell her or him that you want this book, or if they don't have it for you to, uh, if they could order it for you. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, but of course, if you'd like a quicker way to get such, just go to our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Search up this episode number 338 with Gary Singh, and you'll find a couple of convenient links to this book that you will get uh, hopefully delivered as quickly as humanly possible, courtesy of the Prime Delivery Service and whatever Amazon does to get stuff from points A to your point B. Uh, you should also know that Gary will be doing some promotional appearances, and uh, here they are now. On March 2nd, uh, the uh, San Jose Earthquakes against the LA Galaxy at PayPal Park. Uh, Gary will be signing copies of this book, as well as on Saturday, March 9th, against the Vancouver Whitecaps. Again, both at PayPal Park, Prior to the uh, San Jose Earthquake games against the uh, LA Galaxy on the 2nd and the Whitecaps on the 9th, he'll be in the uh, general merchandise store there signing books and taking pictures and chatting Earthquake soccer with uh, any and all. And uh, hey, why not take a snapshot of uh, you with Gary getting a book signed and send it off to your pal Tim and uh, give him a little bit of... um, confidence that uh, this was worth his time this week <laughs> we appreciate that and uh, god forbid we help uh, sell a couple extra books and and everybody making new friends and talking soccer why not we uh, of course encourage you to uh, follow our doings uh, at good seats still available.com we post all of our episodes there of course you got to subscribe or, or follow us wherever you get podcasts you want to make sure you get uh, each and every episode without fail uh, you can send us email if you'd like. We're at hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. And you can follow us on various socials. We're on uh, X slash Twitter at Good Seats Still. And uh, on Instagram or threads or uh, Facebook, you'll find us at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, our thanks, of course, as always, to the great Jerry Payne. Jerry Payne, audio excellence. Thank you, sir, for your uh, your kind service. Uh, to our endeavors this week. And um, thank you, of course, you out there in listener land for uh, for listening. And we're going to send you off. Uh, we have to send you off with uh, the official anthem of the San Jose Earthquakes, for sure. You uh, fans in the Bay Area are probably know this already. But for those who don't uh, outside there, uh, the old firm casuals is the band. And the song is called Never Say Die. This is the Earthquakes version that they did. Uh, It's really awesome, and what an homage to this team. Uh, We'll send you out with it. We appreciate you listening. Until next week, take care of yourselves.